Now, you might not know this, but when they first created the schedule for this year's DPC, this talk was in the little room at the end. And then it got moved into this room, which is considerably larger. So I've been having nightmares that no one would turn up. <laughs> so thank you very much for all being here. And what I'm going to do now is take a photo to prove to myself <laughs> that this actually happened. So smile. And this room is so big, I need three photographs. It's so wide. OK, we're going to talk about APIs. And we're going to talk about HTTP APIs. So if you were thinking we were here to learn about the intricacies of the C APIs in the PHP engine, you're in the wrong talk. HTTP APIs. I do this a lot. I'm an API integrator. I'm a API writer. I'm self-employed, I'm a consultant. I get to see some really, really bad APIs. And I do this a lot, as I say, it's my job. And there's a reasonable chance that one day I might have to integrate against an API that one of you have written. This is my opportunity for it not to be a horrible experience for me. So that is why we are here, to learn what I think makes a great API. Firstly, however, I want to talk about the most important thing about writing any application, and API in particular, is that your API needs to be fit for purpose, first and foremost. Fundamentally, the API has to do its job. It has to achieve the aims of the application, the aims of the business, the aims of your client, whatever it might be. I'm going to talk about HTTP more RESTful type APIs, because they're the ones I tend to like the most. But if you're going to write a GraphQL API, or an, a SOAP API, or an XML RPC API, it doesn't matter, as long as you make sure it is achieving the goals that are required for your application. It must be fit for purpose. I guess I'll over here for a bit, because you're such a wide room. There are five features of a good API in this talk, at least. You will probably come up with another different five features. But we're going to cover these ones. Malleability, correctness, error handling, documentation. And I'm going to have to talk a little bit about security as well. Let's start with malleability. A good API is malleable. I picked that word because I like saying it. Such a nice word, malleable. It almost sounds what I'm trying to say to you. It needs to be flexible. If you're going to write a successful application, web app, desktop app, API, whatever it might be, successful applications last. They last a long while. And I don't know what your clients are like, but my clients change their mind. I bet your clients change their mind as well. I also bet that over time, requirements will change. And flexibility is a key requirement for keeping your API relevant over more than the first year. We can divide this into two things. Let's start by decoupling. You should all be doing decoupling anyway, because it's a really good software engineering principle for making your life better as a developer. And it also works at your API. It tends to get forgotten a little bit because we don't have a view. We don't generate HTML in APIs, so we don't tend to have the, what you would call the traditional view layer. The side effect of that is that we couple our database straight to our output JSON. Really, really easy to do as well. Nearly all the big frameworks have a component that lets you create a database table and essentially push it straight out as a JSON API. Makes life really simple. It's really seductive. Don't do it. <laughs> you will hate your past self when the requirements of the JSON change from the requirements of your database. When your database column names no longer match what you need to render into your JSON. Decouple them. It's really, really important. The representation 
which is the word we use for the JSON, is not your data model. It is an output layer. You should consider the JSON your view layer. And you should have a component for writing your view layer. You do for HTML websites, do the same for your API. When we're talking about APIs, when we talk about PHP, a fairly good one is something like Fractal from the PHP League. There are plenty of other ones out there. Essentially, you have your model objects, and then you want your JSON. You have something like a Fractal Transform in the middle to do the conversion and do the mapping for you. It will make your life much, much easier. Another way of decoupling is to use hypermedia. Hypermedia is a really long word to mean links. It's not a particularly complicated idea. We put links in all our web pages, put links in your API. This decouples your server, your API, from your clients. It means that you can change things on your server, like the endpoints, like you could put a CDN in, and you don't break any client that has already been written. This level of decoupling gives you far more flexibility. It's also really, really hard and difficult to do. But if you can embrace it and put in some hypermedia, put in links to things rather than just straight IDs, again, you can make your life easier. I'm all about making life easier. I don't like repeating work. If I can avoid repeating work, I'm in. And this is one way to do it. But something like that. This is a JSON payload in a format called uh, HAL, H-A-L, Hypermedia Application Layer. There are multiple different standards out there. I don't particularly care which one you use, but pick a standard. It will make everything easier because we can just have client libraries that read them directly. It's a fairly standard endpoint. This is the response to having placed an order. And we can see from the status that the order is shipped. So what's likely to be required now we've shipped our order? Probably going to need to do something with the invoice. So our API has created a link to the invoice within that payload. My client can go and get the invoice without having to hard code and create the link to it. So at the moment, it's sitting at apiexample.com slash invoices slash 873. If at some point I decide to change my system because I've started being so successful, there's not enough numbers left in an integer, and I've moved on to floating point numbers, and it's now a different system, I've used your UIDs, I can change it and nothing will break for my clients. If that 873 becomes a UUID, all my clients will carry on working, sending their invoices. I like sending invoices. We should encourage people to pay invoices too. That's all it is. It's nothing particularly complicated. It just means providing a link to the next step. And then your client can grab that link and call it however it's going to do that. And we are making everyone's life easier and we are decoupling and making our API more flexible. Good API is also correct. We all write for the web, for HTTP. There are standards for how this works. They're called RFCs. RFC 7230 and 7231. 7230 is about syntax and routing and stuff like that. It's quite interesting to read. Request response cycle is all documented in there. 7231 is the one that you should all have already read. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if you've read it because you will only embarrass yourselves by not having read it. It covers things like methods and verbs and stuff like that. It is remarkably well written. It is not particularly long. It is worth your time to read. Understand the fundamentals of the medium that we write applications in all day. It's a good idea. Your API needs to be a good HTTP citizen. So at one level, we're going to need some verbs. So it's a bit restfulish, stuff I do. So there's five verbs that we care about. You've come across them before. You already know about them. 
key thing I want you to remember about picking the verbs is making sure you pay attention to whether they are idempotent or not. Idempotency is the idea that we can send the same request a second time and not screw things up very, very loosely. Nothing will change on the server. So delete is idempotent because once I have deleted a record, if I send another request to delete a record, nothing's going to change. The record is already deleted. Post is not idempotent. So we normally use post for creating a new record on the server. So we post to a collection, we get a new entry in that collection with a new ID. That's great. So you create the post, you send it in from your client, and then you go into a tunnel because you're on a train. Did the request succeed or not? You have no idea. So what do you do? You send it again. If that first request did succeed, you now have two things on the server. You created it twice because it is not idempotent. Pay attention to whether the verb is idempotent or not, and if possible, make sure you pick an idempotent one. This makes things a little bit easier. Things start looking a little bit more immutable, and things that look a little bit more immutable are much easier to reason about. Status codes. You all know status codes, so I don't need to say much about this. They matter. Send the right one. This is really, really easy stuff. You all know about status codes. Do not send an error message with a 200 <laughs> status code. You're all laughing. Half of you have worked on APIs that do that. It's terrible how many APIs are so poor at such a basic thing. And it comes back to the whole idea that we don't think we have a view layer in our API. You do have a view layer. Status code is part of it. Get it right. I particularly care about errors. Errors are the ones that really, really wind me up. Because it's so easy to create a four series error. Because the client end is the one that normally causes the problem. You send data that is invalid or something like that. Now, I don't know about you, but I never read the docs. I get my API keys and I send the command in to find out what happens. And then I explore the API. Good APIs with hypermedia make this remarkably easier. But if you're going to send me back a 200 when it's an error, then something is going to cache it. So when I fix it, I'm standing a good chance of getting that cached 200 error back, because that's the way the internet was designed. If you use a 400 or a 4xx message, none of the proxies will ever cache it, because they know they can't cache it, whereas they know they can cache 200s. Put an e-tag on a forward message, 400 message, it will get ignored by the proxies. Put an e-tag on a 200 message, it will be taken into account and the caching will happen. Use the right status code. The other part of our view layer is the headers and the content of our body. And there's a mechanism in place for making sure that we all agree what formats we're using. There's only two headers involved. We can all count to two. This shouldn't be difficult. There's a content type header. If anyone sends you data to your server, they will include the content type header, and you can therefore decode the body. It's not too difficult. Makes life much easier at our end. The other way, when we send data to a client, we should read their accept header to find out what they can understand. If you get an accept header saying that the client understands XML, and you send JSON, the j client can't decode it. It's not very clever. Make sure you send the right format for your client based off their accept header. Now, I know what you're thinking. Who uses XML nowadays? Nobody uses XML nowadays except for you, for me, for him. It's remarkably common still. But if you're going to write a brand new API today, what format are you going to use? JSON. Everyone's going to use JSON. Except some of us are still using XML. 
What do you think is going to happen in six years' time, seven years' time, eight years' time? Do you think JSON is still going to be the format we're all using? I don't know. There's a reasonable chance it won't be. There's a reasonable chance we'll have come up with something else. And if we do, that API that you wrote that only understood JSON now has to understand the legacy JSON and the new format. And then you'll wish you to put the accept as a handling in at the beginning. Just makes you a good citizen on the internet. I feel like I have to talk about versioning because you can't have an API talk without versioning. Changes will happen in your API. If at all possible, avoid creating a major new version. It is a lot of work to create a major new version that maintains backwards compatibility in your previous version going forwards. The only way to reliably do it is to create a whole new code base, which is hard work, because now you've got to maintain two applications. If you think you could put a second major version onto your API and not create twice as much work for yourself, then you are kidding yourself. It's hard work to maintain multiple major versions of an API. Avoid it if you can possibly can. It's a remarkable amount of stuff you can do without breaking backwards compatibility. If you don't break backwards compatibility, you don't need a new version. You can add new resources. You can add new verbs. You can add new endpoints. You can put new formats via content negotiation. That accept header thing again. You can put new query parameters onto collections lots of things you can do to avoid breaking backwards compatibility you will thank yourself every time you do it if you absolutely must have a new version separate the code out carefully if you only go to separate out your view layer make sure they are very distinct from one another it's really, really hard to keep the business logic from changing in such a way that the version one doesn't break it's easier to split the business logic as well and freeze version one's business logic, at which point you may as well create a whole new app, which is why that ends up the best way forward. I really, really, really don't care how you choose to put your version into your API. You could put it in as a V2 path parameter, you can create a subdomain called V2, you can do it on a content type header. I don't care, I can cope with all of them doesn't make a blind bit of difference. Don't ever put minor version numbers into that version number though. We only care about BC breaks. So a V2.1 makes no sense. Because if I'm a client who supports V2.1, I support 2.2 as well. Because 2.2 is guaranteed to be an enhancement on 2.1 if you're following semantic versioning. So you don't need to put that in your URL and make me have to change it every time you do a new minor release. So don't do that. So I like my APIs to be good HTTP citizens. Possibly got slightly ranty there. There's one thing I want you to pay attention to and take away from this talk, it's this section now. And you can forget everything else I've said, and that's okay, I can live with that. I'm slightly hurt, but that's fine. Pay attention to your errors. A great API has fantastic error handling. This means that your errors are first class citizens. So all the effort you put into making sure that your resources were organized correctly, had the correct sub resources, you designed all that fantastically well. Make sure you do the same for your errors. It feels like an afterthought. It's not. The reason it's not an afterthought is that your client developers read your error messages far more than anyone else. And do you know when they read those error messages? when they are first starting out with your API, when they don't know what they're doing. 
So their first experience of your new API is going to be when they screw it up and see the error messages. You could at least be polite and make it helpful for them. Absolutely key is to make them pretty printable because it makes their life easier. You don't need to pretty print a successful response because practically a client developer is going to see it once, they notice it worked, and then it goes into the processing of the source code. The error messages, they have to read all the time. Pretty printing them is just a convenience to make it that much easier. Similarly, you're going to want to have a code for the computers, an error code, preferably unique, so that they can Google for it or they can put it in their support ticket. We're also going to need an error message in a human readable form that those client developers can understand what went wrong. And if you've done it right, fix the problem without having to talk to you. That is obviously the key thing we want. We don't want new support tickets. If we can get our client developers to solve their own problems, we are winning. Pick a format. Specifically, pick this format. There's a standard for it, RFC 7807, which is an even easier RFC to read than 7231. You should read this standard, you should implement it for all your error handling. Because it's not difficult and it's predictable and it means that any client developer that is developing against your API can plug in an error handling component and it will just work with your error hands. What I quite like about RFC 7801 in particular is that it's got URLs in the keys, uh, sorry, in the values. So the type is a URL. The instance is a URL. The whole intention of RFC 7807 is for the client developers to have links to further information to help themselves. So this is a fairly typical example. The site's down because it's under maintenance at the moment. So status code is 503, that's service unavailable. The type is a link to our generic page about the service being unavailable. The title, could not authorize user due to internal problem. Generic title. Detail, the authentication service is down for maintenance. So the Client developer knows why. There's no point in trying to gain. It's down for maintenance. Further details about this particular problem is provided in the instance. So if you are able to create a specific status page, so if you've got a status.mycompany.com and you've got a report that we know that something is wrong with our, this particular feature of the API, provide a link to it in the error responses. So your client developers can click on it, go to that page, and they'll be able to find out when it's fixed. It's all about making the developers or enabling the developers to help themselves. And finally, there's an error code, which is some sort of code that the computer can read so that the client developers are not doing string matching. We stopped doing string matching in exception handling and started throwing specific exceptions because it's type safe, it is more reliable, and it doesn't go wrong. We do the same in our error handling by providing a code that the a property that the client API can read and know that it won't change. So you don't fix any spelling mistakes. I tend to use strings, as you can see, or service unavailable, as opposed to a number. But lots of people just use number, 34682 or whatever. It doesn't really matter. But once you've assigned a number to a particular error type, it never, ever changes, because it will get hard-coded in all your client apps. And you have no control over those code bases. Good APIs are documented. 
I just told you earlier that I don't read the documentation. You got to laugh. I lied slightly. Eventually, I have to start reading the documentation. And then I get really upset when it's bad. You should have great documentation if you want your API to be adopted. Say you're going to do an e-commerce website and you need to integrate in with the payment gateway. You have a choice between PayPal and Stripe. Which one do you pick? You pick Stripe because the documentation is better, the API is a good HTTP citizen, it's a better API in many ways, but the documentation is standout fantastic. And that makes your life so much easier for integrating it that you don't even bother looking for a competitor to Stripe. And all your developer friends, you tell them that Stripe was dead easy. So they don't bother looking for a competitor either. Good documentation, good HTTP handling, good error handling, all go together to evangelize your API between developers. So what do I mean by good documentation? Firstly, you've got to find it. You're a developer, you're really integrated against this fantastic new API, you have to find it. I deal with quite a lot of enterprise systems. And one particular payment gateway system I have to integrate with has got four different, completely different APIs within the same system, which all have basically the same name, from what I can tell. Essentially, they bought up different companies and rebranded their, AP their APIs into the same namespace. So they're all pay something or another, pay something else, and it's quite easy to lose track of what's going on. So this is standard to enable you, as the API, to tell your users where the documentation is. It's another RFC. It turns out that the people who write the internet standard know what they're doing and have thought about these problems. Who'd have thought it? So 6906 is the profile link. It is simply a way to provide a link to the documentation, arguably one of the more simpler RFCs in the world. Doesn't matter how you do it, you can put it in the header under the link title, or you can put it in the body as just a key. This means that as the client, I hit your API, I fail because I have no idea what I'm doing. I get back a response which gives me a link to the docs. That's nice. I might actually go a bit further with this API now. What sort of documentation you go write? You go write some reference documentation, you go write some tutorials. The reference documentation is vital. However, the reference documentation doesn't let me use your API to its best ability. I need tutorials for that. Tutorials are read by humans in order to understand how to build with your API. They are the opportunity for you to teach me as the client how to use your API to the best way possible. You can give me the best practices. You can show me the ways that don't bring down your servers. You can do that in tutorials. The reference documentation is where I go when I can't work out what exact parameters are on any given endpoint, or I get in a validation failure and I want to find out exactly what the rules are for that particular property. I can't emphasize enough how much I will hate you if the documentation in the reference is wrong. If you tell me this is a 50 character name and you actually have hard coded 40 characters as your limit in the source code, I will be very upset. <coughs> to write your reference documentation, use a standard. I keep saying this phrase, use a standard. This one is not an RFC standard though. Open API specification is one of the better ways to write a document, so to document out to your API. Use it. Don't try to invent your own one, because if you invent your own one, 
all of the tooling that works with OpenAPI will not work for your standards. What's really nice about API, uh, OpenAPI is it encourages a spec-first API design um, workflow. So if you're starting out a brand new API, consider writing the spec first. This has a number of useful advantages. If you write the spec first, it's quite cheap to write it. It's not particularly expensive to write a YAML document. Well, it's YAML, but it's not that difficult. So you've written your YAML document. You can now render it using standard tools into a nice, pretty HTML page, and you can give it to prospective implementers and find out if they like the look of it. Open API is a really rich ecosystem. There are tools around that will allow you to mock that specification and create a pretend server. So you can start testing it out using curl commands, or you can have your client people start writing the client whilst you're still building out the real server. They can do it against the mock because the spec states what is going to happen. You can go one further. You can take that spec and use it to generate validation rules. You can then test your code against the validation rules that were written in the specifications, and then I will never hate you that your references are wrong. What could be wonderful? You should do that. The tooling around OpenAPI spec is getting better all the time and is quite comprehensive already. Definitely worth your time to look into. Highly, highly recommend that one. About security. I'm not going to talk much about security because I assume you know the basics. We, yeah, I'm going to assume that you know at least the basics. Your API is a web application. So you are going to follow those basics of validating your inputs, filtering those inputs, escaping your outputs, all that stuff, worrying about SQL injection, it doesn't disappear just because you're writing an API. You still have to worry about all those things. There are plenty of good talks and all that, so let's not talk about it. So that's something we do care about. You are going to have to authenticate users against your API. It is reasonably likely that your, open, your API will not be completely open to everyone for everything. That way leads to abuse. Put some authentication in. Obviously, there's a standard for that. Guess what? I recommend the standard. OAuth 2. The people who wrote OAuth and then OAuth 2 are way, way brighter than I am. And they have covered and thought about far more, far more, far more many different scenarios than I could ever imagine for authenticating against an API. They have covered them. I only have a small subset of things I want to do on my new API. But then six months later, the business comes to me and say, oh, we would like to do this. OAuth 2 will have the workflow for that new way of doing it, whatever it might be. Maybe we need to run cron jobs now against it, or whatever, computer computer stuff. There will be an OAuth 2 workflow already specified that you could start adding in. That's one reason why you should use OAuth 2. Another reason is that there are client libraries for standards. The nice thing about standards is that people write libraries for them. So you can leverage the fact there is already client libraries for OAuth 2. Your users can leverage that ability. If they want to write their API in Go, there'll be an OAuth 2 library for them to use and they've got authentication against your server. That's why I like standards. Why do we want to authenticate though? We want to identify every application that talks to our API, and we want to identify every user. Start with applications. The reason we care about applications is that occasionally they go rogue. When an application goes rogue, it's your reputation on the line as much as that application's. 
and they might not be intentional. It might be that there's a slight bug in that client application that is accidentally sending 300 megabytes of data every second to your server. It's possible. If that happens, you want to be able to turn it off. If you can uniquely identify each client application that talks to your API, you can turn it off. You can also limit its abilities based on how much money they're paying you, for instance, if you're licensing your API. You can do more stuff if you know which applications are connected. Secondly, your users should be identified because you're going to have user data. And obviously, we are not going to give the wrong user the wrong data because that way leads to very expensive legal bills. If you have an API with user data in it, your user has a relationship with you not so much with the third party client. So take the canonical example of Twitter. My data is with Twitter. It is not with Tweetbot. So why should Tweetbot know my password? I don't think that's a good idea. OAuth 2 has some mechanisms where we can get Tweetbot to have credentials that enable them to get at the data that I let them have whilst I log in via and authorize via Twitter. That's all it does. It's quite a complicated system. It all sounds really scary, but using client libraries and libraries on the server is not difficult to implement, and you are not giving up control to third parties. Don't give up control if you can avoid it. Another borderline security thing, also a performance thing, you can rate limit if you know all those applications. There's two or three reasons why you might want to rate limit. One of the obvious ones is if you are being attacked and someone is trying to break through, being able to limit them is a good move. Fair sharing of resources is equally vital. There's only so much bandwidth you're paying for, there's only so much compute power you have. You should probably be sharing that equally or at least balanced by how much money people are paying you, depending on what sort of API you have. If you have a premium service, then the people who are paying premium might be paying more money, so they get a better access to your servers. They have more, um, they can do more requests per second or whatever. Doesn't matter. You have the control, you should implement that control. The time to implement rate limiting is before you need it. Because when you need it and you don't have it, you're in firefighting mode and you're panicking. It's not a good state to be in. So let's try not to go there. There's only three headers involved. X rate limit limit, X rate limit remaining, and X rate limit reset. So all we have there is how many, so 5,000 in this case is my limit. I can do 5,000 requests in a given time period. I've got none left because I've been extremely active and then rate limit reset will tell me when I can start requesting again. In an ideal scenario, none of your users would ever see this error. You will try to balance it so that under most of the circumstances, most users will never have a rate limit problem. Unless of course they're checking out the world from Composer and to GitHub and then suddenly you see that rate limit problem. But again, GitHub are trying to ensure that they are providing a fair and balanced amount of service to all the API clients. And if I come along and want to download the world, I am being unfair for the absolutely no money I pay them. That's all I want to tell you tonight. I hope that was useful. A good API is malleable, it is flexible, it is decoupled. Good software engineering practices exist in API code as much as in your websites. Your API will be correct. It will follow the HTTP standards because they exist for a reason. You will have fantastic error handling because that's what the client developers read more often than not, and they judge. You'll have good documentation because that way those client developers won't email you 
and nobody likes being emailed for a question that they could have put into documentation or into tutorials. And finally, you will not forget about security. You will make sure you authenticate your users and you will not screw up the basics. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>